In the universe of Star Citizen, there are a lot of spacecraft. From the various non-human manufacturers to the dozens of human manufactured ships flyable in-game now. Needless to say, there have been many other ships since humanity first took to space when the game's official timeline began in 2038. These are ships which we may or may not see in the verse at some point, but for now they make up the background of much of the game's early lore, from transports to dreadnoughts and everything in between. Join me as we look at all of these relics from the verse's past. My name is Paul Shelley, and welcome to the Astro Historian. This is a channel dedicated to exploring and explaining the lore of sci-fi and space universes and discussing their impact. Before we get started on this long list of ancient crafts, I'd like to thank you all for your continued support. We're over 18,000 subscribers, and that is all thanks to y'all spreading the word. So if you've been enjoying the lore content here and haven't already done so, then please hit that subscribe button and the bell icon to be notified when these are released. With that said, let's learn about the old ships of the Star Citizen universe. Now, to begin, I want to mention this is not an exhaustive list. It's as close to an exhaustive list as I could make. The lore of Star Citizen is filled with references to ships in every corner of its narrative. I've done my best to piece together all of the old and lore ships I can find, but I may have very well missed one. If I do, make sure you mention them in the comments below, and I'll try to do a follow-up. I'd also like to mention that almost all of these ships have no visual reference. Zero. Not even concept art. So I'll be using stand-ins from what we have in-game now to try and illustrate what they are closest to visually. The first ship is one I've covered to death in the past, the RSI Zeus. As a result, I'm not going to be exhaustively covering it, but I will leave the link in the top right to my previous video on it for those interested. The Zeus was the first commercially available ship with a quantum engine. The quantum engine was almost certainly installed on other earlier ships, though these were exclusively the domain of corporations and governments. The Zeus represents a Model T of spaceships, the first reasonably priced ship which a moderately wealthy person or a small company could afford. Funny enough, the first very public launch of the Zeus was an utter failure and resulted in the prototype's complete destruction. It took the intervention of the government, either the US or North American Alliance, and the military to fix the issues. It would be entirely redesigned by the founder of what would become the most famous test pilot group, the Reckless 999th Squadron, who was named Michelle Seleno. She would then personally fly the design to its first successful flight, ushering in a new age of space flight for humanity. The ship itself is rather large, likely about the same size as a modern constellation with much less cargo space. This delta wing design is heavily inspired by 20th century space planes like the shuttle orbiter built by NASA, as the Zeus was designed to be able to return to Earth and land like a normal aircraft. It wasn't meant to be long range, designed to be a small transport capable of short range quantum jumps. It had a crew of three, a pilot, co-pilot, and an engineer. We know it saw extensive operation inside the Sol system during the pre-jump point era and saw variations built well after its initial release, with the founders of Arc Corp owning a Zeus IV in 2687. The next ship is the Type IV. This ship has no known manufacturer, but it is likely RSI in origin. It was a long-range transport used in the outer planets of Sol in the 23rd century. It was likely manufactured in the old North American Alliance. The most famous of these transports was the Goodman. The Goodman was registered to the North American Alliance and plied the outer planets when, during a routine trip to Neptune's moon of Nesso, a piece of debris knocked them off course, causing massive damage to their engines. Eventually, they would get everything back up and running, but as they did, they vanished. This was the catalyst for the closing of the space around Nesso, and the rumors of the supposed Nesso Triangle, as many ships had disappeared without a trace in the region. Eventually, Nick Croshaw would investigate the region to discover what was going on, and be the first to chart what was causing these disappearances, what we know today as a jump point. However, that isn't the end of the story of the Goodman. It was eventually rediscovered by explorer Camilla Ganesh and Professor McGonagall in 2944, after a chance discovery of one of the ship's distress beacons in the Croshaw system. It had been floating in the middle of the system, but outside of the well-traveled space lanes and likely too close to the star to have been stumbled upon by explorers looking for new jump points. 
It now resides in the Moeo Museum in Croshaw, where it's still being studied today to determine exactly how the crew met their final fate. The RSI Nova was an early infrarunner ship, likely produced shortly after the first jump points were discovered. Because of its size and speed, it was also used as one of the first racing ships, with Ian Rickard winning the first Murray Cup in his Nova in 2479. The ship seems to have a lot of variations and stick around for quite a while, with the 2822 Nova being mentioned as a particularly popular version. There's also references to the RSI race team beating the Origin race team and their aging 350R, while the M50 was suffering from several setbacks. It is more than likely that this was done with a more modern version of the RSI Nova. This is one of the few ships that I believe has a high likelihood of ending up in the game, its main roles being two which are generally underrepresented, and with racing being a new gameplay loop added to the game, an RSI racer is almost certainly in some form of planning. Let's just hope that they change the name, as CIG is bad enough at naming the stuff as it is. The Stiletto was a medium interceptor sold by Elio Harman Aerospace in the early 26th century. It was one of the first spacecraft designs commissioned by the UPE, and was used specifically to intercept enemy bombers. The Stiletto was intended for space operations only, and the design lineage called up the modular rockets that powered humanity's initial space expansion as much as they did military hardware, and especially anything aviation-oriented. It was sort of a fast, weaponized tube, with a variety of potential technical mounting points to midship, almost like a militarized version of a 21st century space capsule. It was fast and nimble, but lacked shields and limited operational capacity. As a result, it was often relegated to escort and combat air patrol duties during the Tavaran War, as it was constantly outclassed by the superior Tavaran Talon. It was eventually withdrawn from service, but not before an event which would define the stiletto forever. In 2571, the battle carrier UEES Olympus pursued a band of human and Tavarn anti mezzer rebels home to their hiding place in the underdeveloped Null system. The carrier's complement vastly outmatched their foe, but the admiral in charge wanted in on the kill personally. He ordered the Olympus into a pass that was too close to the system's fifth planet, Ashana. The Olympus was caught in the planet's gravity, impacted the world's surface, and was lost with only a few survivors. Those survivors included the carrier's combat air patrol, four stiletto interceptors, plus two others who managed a scrambled launch as the ship went down. Taking advantage of their unbelievable shift in fortune, the rebel forces rallied to eliminate the remaining ships and lifeboats. The battle that followed was spectacular. The six interceptors were able to hold off their attackers for almost an hour, scoring an astounding 37 confirmed space-to-space -space kills, including a pocket destroyer, with only their surviving energy weapons. All six UEE Navy fighters were ultimately eliminated, as were all who escaped the initial crash. But the black box recorder belonging to Lieutenant Jasmine Tuttle was ultimately recovered by an enterprising pirate and sold to her family on Earth. Seeing an opportunity to cover the embarrassing and costly loss of the Olympus, the Navy High Command's propaganda machine broadcast the recording and made martyrs of the fighter pilots and the legend of the stiletto. It would eventually be replaced with the Gladius, which was designed from its inception with new shield technology gained from the Tavaran, and with the lessons gained from the First Tavaran War though it was only finally greenlit as a project because of the last stand of the Stiletto Olympus cap. Next is the Tavarn Jackal. It's a heavy fighter with a crew of two similar to the Hurricane built around the same time, the Second Tavarn War. In fact, there's evidence that the Hurricane was inspired by the Tavarn Jackal. The Hurricane's creator, Leonard Case, was said to have studied the Tavarn way of war, and came to the conclusion that there was no way to brute force the superior shield technologies of the Tavaran. Instead, the key was to surprise and constantly harass their ships with volume of fire. To do this, he studied an unnamed Tavaran fighter, which had a crew of two, with the co-pilot being in charge of manually aiming and adjusting the shields, then inverted the role of the co-pilot from defense to offense. The ship that acts as the mirror opposite of the Hurricane is very likely the Jackal, 
named only in the dubiously canon story the Instrument of Surrender. The Aegis Wildcat is still a bit of a mystery. There are two listed in lore under the same name, and it is likely they are intended to be two entirely separate ships, and given the time and vast quantity of work the writers have done, it's likely a mistake. However, there's also a tradition of ships having sometimes very different versions year to year, like the Juliet Maupin overhaul of the Retaliator in 2783, which is so different it became the basis of the custom Retaliator fad of the 29th century. What we know about the Wildcat was that it was initially designed as a two-person deep space fighter that served with Squadron 214 during the fall of Virgil in 2681. It is likely the progenitor of the modern Vanguard heavy fighter, an early experiment into long-range heavy fighter interceptors. It got a new lease on life when it won a contract for the Volksfighter Contest, a UEE program to deliver rugged and easy-to-maintain fighters to the front lines. It notably beat out the Cutlass for this honor, though has since ceased being produced and fielded by the UEE military. Though I do have to admit, an Aegis version of the Cutlass does sound kinda cool. The Orbital Utility Vehicle, or OUC as it was more commonly known, was Argo's first foray into spaceship design. For most of its history, Argo has been a train and railway manufacturer, having built most of the rapid transit and freight rail systems in the verse. However, by the late 26th century, they had discovered that the biggest holdups for transporting cargo was not their rail systems, but the process of loading and unloading their rail cars to ships to be taken to orbit. To solve this, Argo purchased Tellium Shipworks, a struggling shuttle manufacturer, and became Argo Astronautics. The first ship they tasked their new team to build was a ship to solve this bottleneck issue. The result was the Orbital Utility Craft. This ship used Argo's patented lock and latch system that they had developed to make transporting freight on rails easier, and thus could move cargo to and from cargo ships to trains entirely on its own. This may have also led to the Argo Standard becoming the general standard for freight, known today as the Standard Cargo Unit, or SCU. The OUC became widely popular with non-Argo operators as well, using their OUCs to move cargo from ships to stations and stations to planets, because of its one-stop nature, not requiring any cranes or labor while being small and easy to fly. The result was OUCs being used far beyond their operational life, and modifying older OUCs for tasks that the ship wasn't designed to do, including salvage, rescue, and repair. This led to the creation of the successor to the OUC, the Multi-Purpose Utility Vehicle, or MPUV, in 2619, which was far more modular and flexible than its predecessor. Still, the OUC remained popular and in production until 2665. This is more of a nebulous one, as there really isn't any direct reference to a specific military freighter or freighters, save for one mention being made by Aegis Dynamics. However, it is likely this unnamed Aegis military freighter that served in the UEE Navy for the majority of the Mezer era. We know it was slow and fragile, unarmored and designed to transport vehicles like the Cyclone and Nova tank to war zones. It would often arrive after a beachhead was established as it was far too weak for frontline combat. This was a serious problem for the military, who did a study in the mid-28th century to discover that this practice caused many more deaths than was necessary due to lack of heavy armored support during the initial invasions. The study would eventually lead to the creation of Starlift Command and the creation of the M2 Hercules Starlifter. The Intefagatable class battleship was likely built in the 26th or 27th century, during a known period of rebuilding for the Navy after the end of Project Farstar. This massive battleship is said to be roughly the same size as the captured Vandal carrier codenamed X-12. This would mean the ship is likely capable of housing similar numbers of crew, 1,400. This being the only battleship class ship that was directly referenced as being built by humans, we don't know much in terms of armaments or role. Going by the traditional role of naval battleships, it's not too far-fetched to assume it was heavily armored long-range anti-capital ship and bombardment ship. While we know it did see use during the early Vanduul raids, it has since been retired, likely due to it being far too slow and cumbersome to react to the smaller and faster raiding parties of the Vanduul. However, it has been said that parts of these battleships were used to make up the massive outlawed junkyard station known as Spider, 
so we may yet see parts of that ship. The Reaper class is only mentioned once in lore, very early on in Star Citizen's development. It is mentioned that weapons fire was reported on a Reaper class ship in the Keel system on the 29th of May 2789. It turned out to be a weapons malfunction due to a computer error, but it was reported as it might have inadvertently caused a war with the Xi'an, though luckily the Xi'an forces in the area didn't react. This likely indicates the ship was some kind of capital class ship, likely more combat oriented like a cruiser. Given the name and the period it was built in, it is also most likely an Aegis ship. It also may have been part of the fleet from the 26th and 29th centuries. However, that's all we know about this ship as it was mentioned offhandedly only once. Similar to the Reaper, the Oracle is only mentioned once. In fact, it is mentioned in the same lore article as the Reaper. What we know is that it's a carrier and served the same time as the Reaper. There's only one vessel named, the UES Lighthammer, which served on the Perry Line during the end of the Xi'an Cold War. It is possible that the carrier that crashed on Ashana, the UES Olympus, was an Oracle class. The naming conventions certainly match. Because this ship became the basis of the outlaw settlement of Olympus, built out of the wreckage of that very same ship, we might actually see the superstructure of the ship on Knoll when the time comes. The Gawain class patrol ship was the predecessor to the modern Hammerhead class patrol ship. The ship itself was a hastily converted collier design. Now, a collier in modern parlance means a ship that bulk carries coal. It is unlikely that the Gawain was a ship solely designed to carry coal across the stars, though possible. It is far more likely that this is a legacy name for a fuel and logistics vessel, which seems to be the case in the US Navy today thus making the Gawain a converted military hauler. The reason for such a hasty conversion is likely the Vanduul raids. As the larger, slower, and harder to maneuver capital ships of the 26th and 27th centuries were woefully outmatched by the faster and often more reckless ships and pilots of the Vanduul. Thus, the Gawain was redesigned to act as a fleet screen to protect against these lighter ships and their torpedoes, possibly to screen ships like the Indefatigable, Reaper, and Oracle. The Anvil, Osprey, and Devastator were mentioned early on in the lore of Anvil Aerospace. Despite many other lore ships being retconned or dropped, these two remain in lore to this day. Personally, I had thought that the Osprey was the early name of the Anvil Valkyrie, given the Bell Boeing V-22 Osprey being a transport. However, the names have remained in lore even after the other ships released. It is entirely unknown what these ships actually are. Though part of me still hopes that one of them ends up being the expected but not confirmed Anvil capital ship. The Jupiter was the first true spaceship made by Crusader Industries. Constructed in response to the cargo crisis of the 29th century, it was the brainchild of founder Augustin Lowe himself, who, during a conference with Axel Adamson, the warehouse manager at the time, realized that they had all the tools to make their own ships rather than just shuttles and bring their shuttles to market on their own terms. There isn't any reference to the size of the Jupiter, but the likelihood of the early shuttles Crusader made before the Jupiter, the ones it was designed to carry to market, being similar in size to the shuttles that carry passengers around Orison is fairly high. Thus, the Jupiter would have likely had to be absolutely massive to have been able to carry these ships to their final destination. This is backed up by the Jupiter becoming one of the primary transports for the UEA Army to carry its ground vehicles to the front lines. Seeing as the Hercules can barely fit two Nova tanks, it's more than likely that the Jupiter is easily three to four times as large as the Hercules. Sadly, this was the example used by the developers as a lore ship that will likely never make it into game. Given its likely massive size, it sort of makes sense. The Crusader Saturn Starliner is the predecessor to the more well-known Genesis Starliner. Likely built a year after the successful launch of the Jupiter, it was roughly the same size as its younger cousin, the Hercules Starlifter. It is only referenced once in the Whitley's Guide article on the Hercules. When the UEE called for a flagship for their newly minted Starlift Command, Aegis and Crusader entered. The UEE thought that Aegis would build a bespoke ship, and Crusader adapt their Saturn Starliner, 
but in reality, it was inverse, with Aegis proposing adapting the previously mentioned military freighter to the role, while Crusader pitched the Hercules. We can gather the ship served as the basis for the future Genesis program, and given the very quick turnaround the ship had after the Jupiter's launch, it may have been in development at the same time, like one of the possible contenders for the Jupiter's role, but got shunted over to become its own type of ship, similar to the fate of the M50 and the 85X from Origin. What is almost for sure the case is that this was their foot in the door for passenger transport, one they would kick open with their revolutionary Genesis design. The Bearcat was Aegis's entry into Project Brawler, a UEE project to make a ship that was good at close-range dogfinding, ground attack, and logistical support. It went head-to-head -head with Anvil's Hawk, and would eventually lose. While the Bearcat was said to have been a better fighter and had longer range, the Hawk did adequate on all required roles. I've mentioned the ship before simply because I believe it would be a great addition to the bounty hunting ship lineup, being much more focused on dogfighting over other aspects of a bounty hunter ship. The Direhawk and Shadowhawk are third-party conversions of the Anvil Hawk. The Direhawk adds two additional scattergun mounts, while the Shadowhawk removes two guns and gains stealth armor and a data spike E-War array. Unfortunately, the Shadowhawk is not favored by Anvil, though it was said that the Direhawk was under investigation to become an official variant in the lore at some point. Both would be great additions to the Hawk lineup. With bounty hunting supposedly being on the radar for CIG's development team, the Darehawk allows for more upgunned gameplay, and the Shadowhawk being more stealthy and giving bounty hunters a ship which is designed to hack a target ship. That's it. That's every single ship I could find mentioned in Star Citizen lore, which has not been set to release in the game. Most of these listed are likely to remain in lore, simply stories of ships of the past, and if we're lucky, we'll get some kind of concept art done to flesh out the history. Still, a few of these may end up in-game, likely with name changes, as they do fill holes or bolster the current lineup of ships. If you do find any ships I missed, please be sure to let me know in the comments below. In fact, let me know what ships you'd like to see make it into game while you're there. I'd like to thank you for watching. I'd also like to thank my YouTube members on screen now who chipped in to help keep the lights on. An additional special thanks to the Patreons on screen now for their continuing support. If you'd like to join them for as little as $5 a month, you'll get early ad-free access to videos, including the ongoing Complete History of Star Citizen lore videos, whose first few episodes are out now. Check them out in the top right to see what $5 will get you. Thanks again, and remember, as always, Exhistoria at Astra.